Hello, uh, I'm John Murphy, and I'm a co-creator on Cosmic Debris, a uh, space opera, uh, trip-loving uh, romp comic there uh, with Stu Perrins, myself, and uh, Rob Jones lettering, and Carly Murphy on, on edits and, and design. And you can find us over on Amazon, Comixology, uh, drive Through Comics, through Marcosia Comics, and come see our comic when you're not watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented creator and illustrator of many amazing comics. That he is here today talking about an amazing new comic that I just happened to read upon, which is part of a five-issue series called Cosmic Debris. We're joined by the ever-talented John Murphy. How are you doing today? Uh, can't complain, Kurt. Uh, thanks for asking, and yourself. Doing good. You know, you survive bad weather and you come out better than ever, so to speak. <laughs> For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Uh, right now, bringing a, a sequential uh, storytelling endeavor here in the form of, you know, five issue arc, uh, trope hugging, uh, lots of fun, kind of uh, escapism uh, inspired by being, you know, shut in during COVID, watching and rewatching and enjoying Voyager and these, uh, particularly these holodeck uh, Captain Proton. Uh, episodes and and going back and forth talking with another friend who's also shut in uh, writer Stu Perrins and his love of Flash Gordon and our mutual love of just you know the ability to get lost in these uh, just hokey over the top stripped back to the basics you know super trope I, I, I don't know what to say <laughs> And so it was just uh, this endeavor started out uh, between the two of us as a, kind of a, a way to stay sane through COVID. That's where it really began uh, and then uh, started to kind of grow into a full-blown comic from there. Ran that by, uh, by Marcos over at Marcosia and they liked it. <laughs> what is Cosmic Debris actually all about? You know, there's... Uh, some themes in there and stuff that we were just, you know, kind of uh, dealing with, you know, every day, these, these really heavy negative uh, news cycles, you know, and we have a, a, a regular mustache twirling villain in there, Otto the Obscene, and, and he embodies some of these, uh, these fears and these things and these uh, kind of our fears around seeing a rise of autocracy, autocratic uh, flexing in our politics while having that simultaneously coupled with, you know, an existential pandemic thing. And there's, you know, there's a lot of stress coming from that. It just, the whole thing feels otherworldly uh, and surreal. And, and I think it, it, I think it knocked us all for a loop in that way. And, and so there's a couple of people kind of attempting to just cope with that and find a place to put it where, you know, and, with King Otto, the obscene, you know, we, we have some amount of power where the story goes that we don't, uh, you know, really have in the real world, you know. So uh, this is a place where we get to exert a little control over the outcome of the story and, and, and how it goes. Uh, so there's there's a bit of that uh, going on uh, in there leaning into uh, uh, kind of finding a feeling of hopefulness from these characters that are more... Uh, you know, uh, coming from different walks of life that are just kind of trying to get through the day. These are, aren't exactly, you know, the, the children of privilege or anything like that, uh, what our cast is put together out of. So that's kind of, you know, how we feel too. It's just, we're, we're just kind of work a day, regular people without, you know, otherwise without much power being kind of thrown into this bigger world that we're subject to. Cosmic Debris deals with that. It's our personal way of uh, escaping it yeah, you know, acknowledging this big, horrible existential threat. Well, that's what I loved about reading the first couple of issues there here as well. And and I'll leave the spoilers to you if if you so choose to to give them here. But I loved the the cast of characters were really engaging, really easy to get into. The colors were just beautiful. It like it had a a wonderful vibe of like kind of like eighties colorful cartoons and and nineties feels for for action and things like that. With the just the 
enough absurdity just to make it a believable sci-fi tale as well. There's definitely a lot of, to the bright colors and to the approach of it. Like uh, my my formal education is primarily in animation, you know, uh, looking towards the mechanics of motion and kind of bending, breaking perspective rules, if you will. And a lot of this was uh, uh, intentionally, like we, we thought about like, oh, well, we could put a bunch of, we could get additional team members or this or that, or put it through uh, more and more revisions or something and highly edited. But part of this too was supposed to be simply like, hey, no, this is just a indie thing from just a small handful of people. So let's let it show some of its process and some of its rough edges, because that in and of itself is kind of a testimony to, hey, you can be stuck indoors and trapped kind of and find this inward escape and make this outward expression of it and share it with others and thus feel more connected to one another despite our current circumstances. Let's talk about this amazing team that you have uh, that, actually helped put this all together. You mentioned Stu as well, but what was everyone's roles and how did you all meet together to come up with Cosmic Debris? Well, uh, Stuart and I have met, I think, largely through Twitter, not in real time. I've I've met, uh, you know, several friends here and there and through, you know, regular uh, comic cons, through other types of art jobs. And this is my first real, you know, push into sequential art personally. Stuart, uh, we met through just, uh, you know, collaborating on on a fun little web tube, uh, like a couple of years ago, or having a mutual friend that was doing about the same. So we just followed each other on Twitter and fell into a conversation, honestly. So it was uh, quite by happenstance that maybe we wouldn't have even been online, uh, like as much as we were if not for the uh, current circumstances. So, you know, it, in that sense, it was very much, uh, you know, something that was born from the from the pandemic in the UK and then me being out here, uh, you know, in California. Uh, so that that is where that starts. And then uh, meeting Rob was through just uh, an interest in indie comics and following other people's comics and, artists that I'm interested in and, you know, that I'm, uh, that work on me or I'm learning something from, from looking at their work. And, you know, and Rob was one of these uh, letterists that uh, popped up on several different titles. It was like, Hey, this, this looks good. You know, once we decided we were going to make this comic, I just approached Rob and asked him if he'd like to be on board. As we got into the first issue, then uh, my spouse and I, Carly began to look, take a look at, at Cosmic Debris together, you know, how, how it sat with her. Carly had just finished her education, uh, her bachelor's, and was with an emphasis on, you know, uh, on storytelling, you know, uh, creative writing, uh, had some work, had some editing work as well, and, uh, and big, you know, big sci-fi uh, fan, really up on, on you know, always getting me up to speed there. Who's who and all the classics and all that kind of stuff. She came on board and started giving me uh, some guidance and and helping me with direction. And then uh, basically took over just editing and getting the direction uh, smoother and feeding into the design and the uh, color choice and the palette choices that went into, particularly into the second issue. So you start to really kind of see her touch uh, on the second issue, and then you're gonna you're gonna feel it more full force in the third issue that's coming up. And so, uh, you know, she's she's got a really great eye for the mechanics uh, of storytelling and what needs to be there to push the story forward and what might be uh, extraneous. So we can expect to see things streamlined even a little bit going forward. So what's the most misunderstood aspect about the sci-fi genre that maybe people who don't follow it misunderstand? Oh, wow. Gosh, I I, I, I don't know that, you know, that there's a, a big, uh, like a lot of sweeping, like very general thing. And I'm not sure exactly what a lot of people make of 
sci-fi or you know how many people like take it like real seriously or something like that or what what have you or is this is the stuff of pop culture i think there's a lot of people who would definitely not say that of asimov or or of uh, you know a lot of these uh, questions that come up talked about in a much more complicated way say with like martin heidegger or you know uh, getting into western philosophy and stuff so there's you know, what do people have to say about sci-fi as a genre and as it permeates out into, like, on my level as a folk purveyor of this stuff? Uh, I don't know uh, uh, what people's misconceptions may or may not be. Uh, I, I think it can work as an effective metaphor. Oftentimes it's talking about the here and now and, you know, uh, kind of looking at, at our better or ideal selves. Uh, kind of thing, as much as it is projecting into possible futures. You know, I, I know my thing with Star Trek and uh, like a, a lifelong love of Star Trek is just this, uh, the whole idea that of it depicting a, a, a reasonably bright outcome for humanity, which is, you know, like uh, uh, something that I'm, as much as I love dystopian <laughs> stuff and in and, and, and its place, you know, there's also a place, I think, for kind of space opera, sci-fi, and things that are a, a, little, a bit more lighthearted and, you know, and a place to lose oneself. You know, if anything, in, in, in Star Trek, again, it's like when you look at what, uh, what Tom Paris is up to with the Captain Proton, the uh, holodeck time, is, you know, they talk about the justification for this later when they get into the, uh, again, the holodeck episodes where, where Janeway finally allows herself to have some time. And, you know, the, the model that for the Irish village uh, with the, uh, the spiritful themes and all these sort of things. So maybe that's what's, you know, if there's stuff that's misunderstood, it's like, how useful of a literary tool it actually is. I mean, I mean, if they take it at face value, they could easily just brush it off and not understand the intricacies of what stories or what metaphors or themes they're trying to tell, obviously, too. So I could see that. I, I, there's, uh, you know, there, I, I always hear and I have several conversations regarding like uh, the slickness or the sleekness of a piece and how much cynicism does that or does that not convey at what point, you know, do you really invite the reader, you know, the listener or the, the looker, the observer uh, in uh, to participate with you and how approachable is the piece kind of thing. So I think there's a, a bit to presentation. Presentation has to do with artist intent, I think, too. Is it supposed to feel kind of warm and fuzzy and folky? You know, I, I think cosmic debris is. That's, it's very much supposed to be rough around the edges and Captain Proton. And something that we went to the holodeck and programmed this the best we could, you know, to get through the day. And also to say, hey, you can do it too. Uh, we can be creators and, as well as consumers and participate in, in this bigger dialogue. You know, the characters that you've developed uh, with, of course, with Stu and, uh, you know, your amazing team together here. What was the first image that kind of popped into your mind as you were maybe sketching or drawing one day that just really inspired this cosmic debris to its current state? Oh, wow. Um, well, I, I actually wish I kind of had this, you know, because uh, I, I have some uh, some initial character designs uh, that were right around here. Part of this was really uh, hitting on this. All roads lead back to Captain Proton. So, <laughs> you know, there's uh, Chaotica, and you know, and he's uh, out to win the heart of Arachnia, the uh, queen of spider people. And you know, and that kind of really sparked the conversation about Flash Gordon with Stuart and these outrageous mustache twirling villains, and just like our mutual love of that. And then there's that's the first initial drawings that popped out. And like the more outrageous, the better, you know? So it's like, there's so many just great artists out there. You know, I started getting into like looking at characters like the Joker and stuff like that and his treatment over time. And these artists uh, that would use these heavy, like lurching furrowed brows to convey this like just insanity, just somewhere completely elsewhere, as we all know the Joker to be, right? Yeah. 
uh, if there's one thing that's consistent about them, it's that, you know, there, there's so many great ones in there too, portrayals. Uh, uh, it's the, uh, too many for me to list. That, that's where it really started. And then it branches out from this Orlock, Orlock Shrek character. Everything permeates from him and Otto almost immediately gets born. And then we, we started thinking of this, you know, that Otto needed sycophants, you know, because we were uh, very, very concerned about some of the things that were going on, you know, but, and we're like, you know, how do we comment on that or show those people and, you know, what we're seeing at least. And then it just started into this flood of like, okay, let's find all the most ridiculous over the top mustache twirling villain stuff we can find. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's what we want to bring to the table here. Well, well, you've succeeded so far, and I can't wait to see how how this all comes about and comes to an end uh, once you reach issue five here as well, too. So, I'm loving, like I said, what I what you've done so far, and I, I can't wait to see more coming in the future. Who are your top three mushle twirling villains that you can safely say are the worst in all of media? Oh gosh. It's, and I, I could almost halfway cosplay him right now as Fifth Element. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's Zorg, I believe, but it's Gary Oldman. Yeah. And this is all Mobius's concept art, you know, I, I believe that went into the foundations of this. Like, uh, what's not to love about him and Judd Worski? Uh, Wors- but the uh, that character was just, uh, he, was, he was fantastic uh, to me. There's certain like actors actually that I really like that are like the Snidely Whiplash, you know, uh, kind of classic to me. <laughs> and, the, uh, and one of the other ones was Alan Rickman. And it just, you know, that is, you know, just his attitude, his swagger, and the way he would go about delivering his lines as a villain, not, you know, like he really, he, he really got me. And one of these ones was, I, I don't remember too much of the, the, like the movie itself outside of just like, to me, the Robin Hood movie was probably like, I, I don't know whether it was good or not, but it was all set up for this one Alan Rickman line for me, which was, you know, I'll cut his heart out with a spoon, you know, and then you have sick of it. Well, why? You know, because it's hard, you know, and it's just his delivery. He's just, he's amazing. <laughs> You know, well, what's not to love about that guy? There's deeper villains that aren't mustache twirling ones that, that, that I'd like to get into someday. But right now, this these ones, you know, that come across really straightforward. And and they're 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 proud of their villainy. It's like Titus Andronicus and Aaron giving his speech, his vindicated speech at the end, and what a proud piece of villainy he has constructed for his enemies. <laughs> and to exact his revenge upon them, although he comments his worst. But yeah, <laughs> there, there's a few of them out there for me. But yeah, Rickman, Zord, wow, Fifth Element, for sure. Um, I think the, the, the one that got me uh, the most, and uh, the name eludes me right now, and she is just, just uh, amazing. She was in the Pulp Fiction Thing and she really pulled together the Star Trek uh, season of Picard for me recently, and, uh, and and she was driving this this great big ship, the Shrek or something like that, in this Picard thing, and I was like, wow, if I'd only seen this when I was thinking of this character, <laughs> that's another one. <laughs> The publishing side of things here, obviously, uh, Marcosia is, is something you mentioned as well, too. Talk about your, your journey so far of how you, as an independent creator, have been published or, and where we can find the current issues of Cosmic Debris as well. Oh, uh, yeah. So um, right now, the first couple of issues uh, are over on uh, you know Amazon Comixology uh, and everyone, you know, people have their feelings. I have my feelings as well. Issue one, I know, is up on drive through Comics and uh, I, I believe issue two should be there shortly uh, if it's not there already. There are some alternative uh, sources to that. Uh, I can't speak uh, beyond that for uh, what else what else is out there. I know there's some other great uh, digital uh, comics platforms, but uh, Drive Through Comics right now is is the one that uh, Marcosia is is working through uh, a lot for, for a comicsology alternative. And there it shall be until we hit the fifth issue. 
and then once uh, once that happens, then there there may be a uh, a small print run if we uh, continue to to uh, build a little bit of interest, uh, which right now it seems like there is. So, you know, we'll we'll uh, keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best, and just enjoy ourselves and enjoy the ride here with the with the next three issues. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power, and this can be either the written word or the visual? Oh. Hmm. Yeah, that's a that, that's a that's a really good question. But I, I I was probably you know I was pretty young. Uh, I think you know, and that's that that's that's a, like a core root question where you can see the turn of a phrase or uh, a simple expression of uh, affection or endearment uh, towards someone and see it affect their mood or perhaps change their mood, perhaps from something sad or or something along those lines to something that, uh, that, that is a bit more joyful. You know, the ability to bring a, a change of cheer, uh, so to speak, with, with just the turn of a phrase is, uh, I think I probably the first time I came across that is just, you know, interacting with, uh, with my mother, probably. Uh, as a kid, and this is something that that I became intrigued with more more deeply, you know, later in in, in like junior high high school, and really uh, reading and more uh, historical uh, nonfiction and fiction. Really, really intrigued uh, at this point at what can be done uh, with with just a word. And then uh, there was a deep love affair of Ralph Bakshi, and uh, you know, and, and you know, I like a lot of his work, uh, but Wizards in particular, you know, really gets down to this with uh, Black Wolf uh, and Avatar's uh, brother in this. And, and that, that is when it's like, hey, that's how powerful words are. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Wow. Um, you know, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, uh, again, there's a couple different things there. There's, uh, you know, a friend of mine, Brandon, told me, you know, when, when I was really in the throes of anxiety, and really have a lot of self-esteem issues that are born from a rough childhood and stuff, the ingrained stuff. And he's like, hey, you know, if you... You need to always believe that your work has merit. If you don't believe your work has merit, you will stop working. And that's, you know, that's one of those, okay, that's a big, you know, heavy hitting, heavy hitting thing, you know, as far as, uh, you know, we're talking about just kind of the need to work, the feeling, the compulsion to create. So, you know, you really kind of have to create to to feel good. Wow, the second wisest thing. <laughs> One of the things that, that I've heard for a couple of people, because I've heard, I guess, my first review that I felt to be unfavorable or something, I immediately got my feelings hurt and everything. And I was like, yeah, and I was outraged and, you know, I'm, I'm over it now. And, <laughs> and that's that's one of the things is like a couple of my friends were telling me, you know, Murph, you know, it's like, hey, you don't make this stuff for everyone. It's not for every single person or this or that. So don't get your head wrapped around the axle and don't, don't get beat up on whether it works on one person and not the other or this or that, you know? And, and so see the separation there of your, own, you know, emotional attachment and seeing it as an extension of yourself, you know, and let them have their own experience with it without me interfering at that point. Uh, so I, I thought that was like really important for my mental health as a creator. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Wow. Um, you know, my original animation teacher really like set me on, on, a, on a very good path, uh, Jerry Bryce. And I was lucky enough to study under him for a while and to get an idea of what my life might look like as a tweener or with Disney. And that that person is, you know, really just like had so much to do with my development and, you know, looking at classical artists, El Greco, uh, looking at other artists, Ernie Barnes, 
uh, you know, really getting into Tex Avery and motion jokes and uh, Chuck Jones, you know, so that, that that stuff is really just, wow, that's, that's the foundation uh, stuff for me uh, as an artist. And then there's one or two other really pivotal people in comics that just made me feel welcome, you know, and encouraged me, hey, why don't you give, you know, Crossing Over a try and you seem to really love storytelling, you might be good at this. That would be, uh, you know, one of the really warm, inclusive people was Chris uh, uh, Roberson. It was just really nice to me and encouraged me to just take a look around and learn as much as I could and get involved. And, you know, just that encouragement and allowing me to, uh, you know, kind of like look around this this feel that I hadn't uh, even really realized was there, you know, or how to look at it. From a professional standpoint, you're, of course, uh, an amazing illustrator and comic creator, not only with Cosmic Debris, but I'm sure other works that we haven't had a chance to talk about, which just means you have to come back on the show in the future and we'll dive into whatever you decide to create and enjoy. And I'm, I'm sure it'll be a wonderful experience overall because I love what you're doing and I can't wait to see what else you do. So, Professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Wow. Uh, I consider myself, like, personally, really, really very, very lucky. Uh, it's the uh, just absolutely uh, very fortunate, you know, and, and for the most part, I've gotten to string together, you know, a series of sign design and production art, uh, page layout jobs, and, and there's been some hard, you know, some real hard you know, underwater welding, uh, stint of learning how to hard hat dive, all that kind of stuff with the, with the Navy to pay for a GI bill to keep going to school and some construction. And uh, just being able to string it all together is, I guess that's success. I, I think it's, there's a lot of luck, a whole lot of luck. I was going to say, is it truly peaceful underwater diving and welding at the same time? Absolutely. The first time that that I that I was a few hundred feet down, where I was uh, able to, it's just it's it's something else. It's it's otherworldly, uh, you know, encounters with with other creatures, as well as just going about your business and getting your job done when you're there. But um, yeah, I, I I don't really have words for it, and that's why I'm starting actually some other journaling and and some other drawings around that and. Yeah, there's a lot there. It's very peaceful at times. Sometimes it's like terrifying. Uh, what was a peaceful moment and what was a scary moment then when you were underwater? Uh, I think uh, the most peaceful moment, I was just uh, walking around uh, an older wreck and I came across a, an open uh, a, a compartment towards the, towards the tail uh, end of it. And there's just this great big, much bigger than me grouper uh, living in this cave and just kind of slowly breathing and just, you know, just, mm. and wasn't really bothered by me at all. Uh, didn't seem to mind that I was there uh, and just kind of sat there with it for a little while and just kind of just, you know, oh, my comms aren't working. I, you know, I'll, I'll be with you in a few moments, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and took some time off <laughs> on that dive, and it was worth it. <laughs> the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, I think that's tied to what do I define as a failure uh, from self? And, and I think uh, I define uh, in words or, or a failure of, of myself as a collapse of emotional bandwidth uh, as a result of being overwhelmed by my own narcissism. And that starts to rub up the wrong way against constructive criticism and other things of this nature and, you know, and all, all the ugly things that narcissism is. So that's how I know that. I'm dealing with some dealing with some failure, and it's usually a, a big growing pain thing. And it's time for me to kind of step back, you know, have a nice big slice of humble pie, and uh, and see if I can, uh, you know, <laughs> do a good self inventory and take some constructive and loving criticism on board. The younger generation is looking at your work, and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. Whether it's as an illustrator, a comic creator, or somewhere in between, maybe you've inspired them on their own path to be 
a creative person? How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Wow. Um, you know, I think there's a lot to the, uh, you know, standing on the shoulders of the, the people who came before you and looking all, uh, a bit further into the horizon. So uh, I think there's a lot to say for just, you know, very simply, you know, keeping it, uh, keeping it real, you know, and kind of like, you know, be, being your true authentic self and uh, finding a home for that and seeing the value in yourself and, and really getting a grasp on an intrinsic value and what that means to you as an individual and to your counterparts that you're uh, sharing your experience with, you know, because, uh, you know, everyone's generationally too has, you know, uh, has different experiences as well. So uh, knowing that, that, that that's something that is worth reflecting upon, uh, documenting and sharing and belongs in a, a bigger dialogue. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. It'd be something about, like, uh, meandering, but not altogether aimlessly, uh, but meandering nonetheless. You know, I'm very much an enjoyer of the journey, an enjoyer uh, of the process. And I think, uh, you know, a, a lot of the soundtrack is, you know, I, I have this deep, long uh, love affair of uh, very peaceful piano stuff. And then uh, a music that has a whole lot of lilt to it. So there's there's a deep love of Jelly Roll Morton and Scott Joplin in there. And then getting right into Jump Blues and some straight ahead jazz stuff. Uh, so I think there would probably be a whole lot of that for a soundtrack. <laughs> well, John, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is this amazing comic and anything else you'd like to promote and share about? Well, you know, uh, for the next, the, the remainder three issues of this, then, you know, you can check in with Marcosia at their website and, you know, drive through comics, uh, uh, wherever else uh, Marcosia is, is distributing. And then, and then uh, eventually that will go to print uh, via them. Uh, and you know, it's on Amazon Comixology, uh, and cosmic, you, you have to, uh, you have to, uh, by the way, you know, disambiguate there's, there's several cosmic debris and the other two are pretty amazing. Uh, so, you know, it, it takes a little poking around for right now. And, you know, and just for me and my paintings and what I do, uh, uh, uh outside of this, uh, that you could find me through my social media, uh, um, uh, that's, uh, what am I anyway? I'm uh, Art of J. E. Murphy on on Twitter. Uh, I don't know how long that place is lasting and how much I'm uh, using it, but I do advertise a little bit there right now. And then over it, you know, there's this digital homelessness taking place with everyone, uh, yeah, as you know. So it's you got to kind of just look around. Uh, so right now I'm John Murphy on Blue Sky, and uh, I love to follow other creators back. There's a lot to learn all the time, I'm constantly learning. So and, and and engaging that I love engaging other people. So that's another great place to, to find me as well. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T W O, not the number two different website you don't want to go to trust me the website's going through a revamp so go to our youtube channel which is youtube.com forward slash tgt media the podcast is back after 12 or so years you can find it at two geeks talking .com or just search for two geeks talking wherever you listen to your podcasts and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening watching on two geeks talking